Previous videos showed how the Earth's sedimentary rocks are like the pages of a book, taking us back through time. 19th century geologists discovered that the lowest and oldest layers contained a small variety of very primitive marine species. Higher sedimentary layers held more varied and more complex creatures. The progression suggested that these animals didn't appear suddenly, but were gradually evolving. But there were sudden disappearances. This layer of rock, for example, marks a catastrophic mass extinction about 250 million years ago. The rocks below this line are full of marine fossils, but in the rocks above, they're all gone. There were five global mass extinctions we know of, each one wiping out between 50 and 95 percent of species. Each was followed by the gradual recolonization of the Earth by surviving organisms that again began to change and become more complex until the next mass extinction. If this increasing complexity really did mean some kind of evolution, we'd expect to see it in individual species as we track their fossils through millions of years of sedimentary rock. And we do. Either each species is suddenly being killed off, only to be replaced by the sudden appearance of something that's almost identical, or we're seeing the changing morphology of a single species through time. We'd also expect to see traces of an animal's evolutionary ancestry in its morphology today, and we do. Take a look at this skeleton of an ape's hand. It looks just like a human hand, except it's not. In fact, it's not an ape's hand either. It's a whale's hand, or at least what used to be a hand in its ancestral past and is now used as a flipper. The morphology of animals today is full of remnant body parts that have been changed and adapted, just as evolution predicts. In the video on natural selection, I showed how a hypothetical animal might evolve into two different species. At first, the two types would be able to reproduce, then reproduce with difficulty, and then not reproduce at all. We can't watch it happening in mammals today because it takes several thousand generations, but we can see snapshots of it frozen in time. Modern horses, for example, separated from zebras several million years ago. They can still reproduce, but with difficulty, because a horse's DNA has 64 chromosomes and a zebra's 44. When an offspring is produced, it's sterile, exactly what evolution would predict. An even better example is found around mountains, where a species evolves as it spreads geographically. Each species can interbreed with the one next to it, but the species at each end of the line can't interbreed with each other. Among organisms with very fast reproduction rates, such as bacteria and flies, separation into new species has indeed been seen. This, for example, is a flavobacterium that eats nylon. It was found in a waste outlet near a Japanese factory that produces the stuff. The problem is nylon was only invented in 1935 and is completely synthetic and undigestible to other bacteria. Does this fit perfectly with evolution and they evolve because of a mutation sometime between the invention of nylon and their discovery 40 years later? The answer came when researchers kept a completely different bacterium in a similar nylon-rich environment and the same mutation occurred. DNA research has only added to the overwhelming evidence of evolution, but it's also completely shaken up the evolutionary tree and shown in much greater detail which animals share a common ancestor and when they separated. Researchers are now manipulating DNA to discover a treasure trove of evolutionary information. It's long been known that ancestral traits buried deep inside DNA can get switched on by accident with very obvious results but they can also now be deliberately switched on in research labs. Chickens, for example, don't have teeth, but their distant ancestors did, and the code for it is still buried in their DNA. Activate the right gene, and you get a chicken with teeth. One of the commonest misconceptions about evolution is that we never find a transitional form between one species and another. But the fossil record is full of animals changing from one kind into another. It's one of the reasons we know evolution happened. Every animal is a transition between what went before and what comes after. If you think we haven't captured the instantaneous moment that one species turns into another, that's because there isn't one. It's like asking, where's the intermediate form between this and this? We know that this species existed at one time and is now gone, and it seems to have been replaced by this species. We can scour the archives and dig up as many transitional photos of George Bush as we like, but we're never going to find a single shot of W changing from a baby into a man. 
What we will find are the various transitional forms in between. If you're talking about gaps in the record, sure, there are lots of them. This is all I could find when I googled images from the life of George Bush, so of course there are gaps. If I went on a digging expedition, I could probably find a hundred more. But even if I had a thousand chronologically spaced photos of George Bush, there would still be gaps in between. As I mentioned in the last video, we now know that evolution, just like the growth of George Bush, doesn't happen evenly. The few years in between this photo and this one mark very few changes. But there's been a huge change in the same period of time between this photo and this one. But even when evolution happens quickly, it's still not instantaneous. For some animals, we've got a very good fossil record, and the time gaps between fossils are small. This shows evolution very clearly. For other animals, the gaps are longer, and the record is far less complete. Yes, I get that a lot. A theory in scientific nomenclature is the highest form of proof you can get. To go any higher, you have to enter the realm of mathematics. In all the sciences, there's still a lot more to discover, a lot more to understand, and a lot more to explain, whether it's atomic theory, the theory of gravity, or the theory of evolution. These are all called theories. So if you don't understand what a theory is in scientific terms, then they're what you would call facts. And using common terminology, evolution is a fact. It's so much a fact that researchers now depend on evolutionary theory to study antibiotic resistance and crop pests and new diseases and to develop new drugs. Understanding evolution isn't just important for understanding our past, but our future.